All right, I think we are at the appointed hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Doyle Hodges. I'm an adjunct professor here in the Shar School, and uh, for about four years was also the executive editor of Texas National Security Review. I also do some adjunct teaching at Princeton, and before that I was a naval officer. Uh, among the courses that I teach here is the course on ethics and the use of force and a course on maritime security. So the combination of those two draws us, I think, directly into the topic of this panel, which is ethics in the commons. Uh, when I call this a panel, you may notice that there are only two of us. And unfortunately, uh, Sam Baldwin, who I was really excited to, to hear about with some of her work that she's done on disinformation, uh, came down with COVID and is unable to join us. So instead, it's going to be a conversation with myself and Patrick, and I'll have Patrick introduce himself in a moment. Uh, but, you know, I think given that it's just the two of us, rather than trying to make it a panel, we're, we're going to do it more as if it's a podcast, just the two of us having a conversation about these sorts of topics. And I think we've had a number of really fascinating topics queued up for us in the discussions that preceded us. And, you know, for myself as a political science nerd, the topic of ethics, ethics in the commons is at the heart of security studies and ethics in IR. Because if the defining feature of the international system is the lack of a supranational authority, then the question of where do the rules come from and who enforces them? How do you regulate behavior in these spaces where no state, no party, no individual has an unquestioned right to exert their authority is really the distillation of all the really interesting and fascinating questions that govern how states interact with each other and do these sorts of things. And so you'd see mechanisms of control evolving, sort of if you conceptualize them in increasing levels of strength, you have customs, you have norms, you have rules, you have laws, in some rare cases you even have taboos. But the question is where do those come from? How do they achieve force? And before we even get to the discussion of how those things operate in a commons, we also have to ask what we mean by a commons because I think there are at least four different types of commons that we've discussed already today. There are commons that are a place where the thing that is being regulated is access, and the maritime and space domains come to mind as examples of this, and that gives rise to one set of rules and norms and laws and customs. There are commons that are a place, but where there are resources, and the depletion of those resources is what is to be regulated. And that gives rise to a different sets of concerns because the types of questions of distributive and reparative justice are very different types of questions than just questions about whether somebody can go there. There are commons that are intangible. And here I think about the cyber domain where there isn't a place that we call the internet. The physical inter infrastructure of the internet is, exists pretty much all on sovereign territory or is the sovereign property of a state, but what is exciting and interesting and gives rise to conflict about the cyber domain is not the physical infrastructure, but it is its existence as a place for the commerce of ideas as well as for commerce and a place where information and intellectual property, which often is protected and governed and regulated by states in one way, interacts in a domain where other states may not have the capacity or the interest in honoring that mechanism of governance or protection. And then you have a final type of commons and that there may be other types that I'm not considering, but that actually where the rules themselves are what define the commons. Where if I think about it from the perspective of the rules that govern AI, that is the commons. If I think about commonly accepted medical practices, that is a commons. If I think about banking rules, those become a commons. And indeed, that becomes fascinating because who determines the rules that themselves are constitutive of the space that they are in? So there's a lot of really fascinating questions that I think you, you get examining here, and these are the questions that normally cause states to go to war. Because these are the questions when people disagree over who gets to set the rules and who wins and who loses that cause states to recourse to coercion and force. And so I have the great benefit of sitting beside an ethicist who thinks about these sorts of things for a living. And Patrick, I, I guess the question that I would throw to you first is, where do rules and rights and duties come from in a commons? Uh, well, 
And actually, if you could first introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, so. All right. So, uh, so I'm Patrick Taylor Smith. Uh, I'm uh, trained as a social and political philosopher. Got my PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle. I've been a postdoc at Stanford. I've uh, been a professor in Singapore and the Netherlands. And for the last couple of years, I've been a resident ethics fellow uh, at the uh, Stockdale Center in the US Naval Academy. And uh, my work primarily has been on, um, we might call it the Ethic, the sort of anticipatory ethical and political evaluation of emerging technologies. So I do this in the context of climate technologies like geoengineering and in the context of military and security technologies. So I kind of view myself as sort of a climate justice theorist as well as a military ethicist that I work on. I mean, when you say where they come from, I mean, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that it seems to me that the ethics of various cases depend a lot upon which, what you would say which commons you're in, right? So. If we think of the, the standard commons, like as in Garrett Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons, right? There's a couple of important features of those sorts of commons that structure your ethical reasoning about it, right? So one is, uh, so one is, is that this is a, a good that can be eventually over-consumed, right? Ex or exploited, right? So this, I think, works for space when you're thinking about there's just a certain number of safe orbits. And once, you've and once you've used up the safe orbits, now you then have to take on additional risks. Um, so in other words, I mean, so the standard definition, right, of a common good is one in which its use is rivalrous. That is, as if I use it, then you can't. And non-excludable, I can't keep you from using it. Um, and in space is an example of this. Uh, overfishing is a clear example of this. If I catch the fish, you can't catch the fish, and I can't exclude you from trying to catch the fish because the ocean is owned in common. Now, one of the important features of that structure is that my forbearance doesn't necessarily have any effect on whether the good is consumed. Uh, since, so, and that, I think, is a key feature of the ethics of, we might say, standard commons, right? Where if I don't overfish, if I'm, just, if I'm a fisherman and I don't overfish, the other fishermen are going to overfish. And in fact, the fewer fishermen overfish, and there's a lot of say, use the word fish, the fewer fishermen that overfish, the more rational it becomes for me to overfish, right? Um, uh, especially because at the limit case, if no one else is overfishing, then I can actually take as much as I want without consuming the good, right? So this means, this creates, according to Hardin, right, this creates a, a sort of structure in which the collectively rational thing, the collective preference, is for everyone to sort of use it sustainably, but it turns out that no one can do that because essentially uh, you're in a Nash equilibrium where no matter what, uh, no matter what other people do, the rational thing is for you is for you to consume. Now that creates an ethical structure, right? Where is like because I think this leads to the fundamental ethical question when it comes to those sorts of commons is like, do I have an obligation to be a sucker? Right? Do I have an obligation to sit there and forbear while everyone else consumes the good? Right? So does, does that make sense? It does. And, and I want to add a wrinkle to that if I can. Because, you know, one of the classic works of political science that came about early in the computer age was Axelrod's work on deterrence and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who haven't read it, basically they set up a game where the only choices were to cooperate or defect. And as long as there was what he referred to as the shadow of the future, as long as you knew there was another turn, the most effective strategy was always tit for tat. That I'll cooperate if you cooperate, and if you defect, I'm going to punish you for defecting. And that resonates with an awful lot of realist political science, right? That makes sense. That goes back to what Jamil was talking about, about, you know, we haven't made it costly enough for people to engage in negative behaviors in the cyber commons. But the further in the future that consequence is, the more difficult it is for it to have that effect, and especially when it's so far in the future that it's not going to have that effect on you. Meaningful. You're going to have as many fish as you want, but your grandkids aren't. Mm -hmm. So how do we factor in this time factor when it yeah. starts coming into generational consideration? And so this, and so this leads, I mean, so this leads to sort of also uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work, all right, which is that in order for you to manage, in order for you to essentially manage this tit for tat dynamic. You need staged sanctions. You need monitors that determine when the norms have been violated. And so you start getting closer and closer to what are 
governance structures, not necessarily a state. So Ostrom comes up with a lot uh, in her work governing the commons, looks at a lot of different cases in which the commons are successfully governed locally without formal state structures, but they do have executive, legislative, and judicial functions, essentially. Um, but I think in this particular case, I think you gotta think about um, what I would call the natural duty of justice, right? So I think when it comes to what your duties are within a political system, it matters a lot whether just institutions have already been created or whether they haven't been created. And I think um, a lot of people in, when they talk about the ethics of the commons, they think about only two possibilities. We sort of act as if we're already governing the commons, which is the forbearance case, right? I just don't, I consume only my fair share of the fish, regardless of what other people do. Then the other scenario is a moral free-for-all. If other people are consuming the fish, I can consume as many fish as I want, right? So I think there's a third possibility here, which is that your moral obligations in those cases are to create the structures that would allow for fair and equitable governance of the commons. So you have an additional, so this is a, this is a you might call it a meta obligation of justice to create the sort of relevant institutions that would allow you to relate to people in a fair and equitable way. So you, you've used the word fair a couple of times here and you've talked about justice. And whenever I consider whether something is fair to me, one of the things that is always lurking in my mind is how I was treated in the past. Mm -hmm. And so, especially as it comes to global commons, we have a really interesting case that many of the states of the global south and other states that are newly industrialized are only just now getting to the capacity to extract and exploit the commons in the way that more developed states have for decades or centuries. Mm -hmm. Does a calculation of their fair share take into account that they couldn't get access to the commons for decades and that now we know better, you, you need to behave yeah. differently? So I wonder, so you might say, I think there are, maybe, there are actually two questions implicit there. One is, a, is their fair share, once we've created the governance structure, is that affected by the fact that they weren't in a position to exploit the commons before? That's one question. I think people are, I would say I'm broadly unsympathetic to that, to that view. Um, but there is one in which I'm much more sympathetic to, which is the flip side of this, which is that do the countries who have been exploiting the commons for that whole time and haven't done the work of creating fair governance structures, do they owe reparations? Do they owe corrective justice for taking more than their fair share from the commons? And I think this is something, uh, you know, if, uh, I don't know if Luis is here, I can't tell. I, uh, he might say this is a very common argument within the global south, which is, which is that the United, especially when it comes to climate justice, is that the United States, Europe, they owe, uh, they owe reparations in the form of greater emissions permissions to uh, the global south because they took more than their fair share for so long. And I, and I think I'm more sympathetic to that view than I am to the other view because essentially, because once you've created the new structures, well now we're relating to each other differently than we were before. Before we were relating to each other as simply atomistic people maximizing our interests, now we are working together to manage the commons. You know, another version of that argument is that the more developed the economy, the more capable it is of absorbing the cost of shifting to, for example, forms of energy that are less polluting. Mm -hmm. Um, but that puts into conflict, I think, one of the quintessential questions of the commons is how do I weigh my duty to my citizens to provide them a prosperous economy in which they can find meaningful work and an affordable living versus my duty to this very diffuse global thing? Yep. So how, how do I weigh those things? They don't seem commensurate. Yeah, I mean, so there's... There's a bit of literature in ethics called the dirty hands literature uh, in which they argue that the specific role morality of political leaders means that they have to do things that would be, according to universal principles of morality, wrong, um, which is like favoring their interests over the interests of others. But I suppose one thing I would say is that if you gain those resources by wrongdoing, and let's grant for the sake of the hypothesis that the exploitation of the global commons or the unilateral exploitation of the global commons when, say, say when, it, comes, when it comes to climate change. Um, 
uh, and thereby imposing very severe risks on vulnerable populations. One thing to keep in mind about, the, about climate change is that the worst impacts of climate change are almost invariably going to fall upon the people who are least responsible for it. And you might think that that action, imposing risks for your own benefit upon the people who are least able to adapt to them, is itself a form of wrongdoing. And if you are, if you, if you, you, have engaged in a form of wrongdoing, you can't complain when we reduce the benefits of that wrongdoing and give them to someone else. Like you get, so morality can be over demanding. It can demand too much of you. But if it can't be over demanding, if we, all we're asking is for you to give back your ill-gotten gains. But what if I wasn't the one who took them? What well, if it was a previous generation? That's exactly right. And so this is where the rep, this is so, when is it the case? When is it the case that the sort of the, the I don't know, global, I mean, I'm going to ask a question how to define the global north, and it's going to involve Australia? I don't, um, uh, but like, when is it the case that the global north gained, let me say, culpability for its emissions behavior? Right. And that's both an epistemic question, like it's when was it plausibly understood that people knew that climate, the, the, the emissions behavior was going to have, the, their emissions behavior was going to have that, and also, um, uh, who is the agent that did it, that made the choice, and also when is it the case that plausibly understood we were regulating the commons such that it made sense for people to do it. And these are, I think they all kind of point in slightly different directions, because epistemically we knew it a long time ago. But. So up to this point we've been talking, I think, about what the classic commons is. I mean, you're, you're right, this is the Harding, the, the version from the tragedy of the commons. But certainly if we think about the story that we heard this morning from Kathleen about migration across the maritime commons. Mm -hmm. And if we think also about the cyber case, I think one of the defining features of the commons that creates the challenges that we deal with from an e ethical and a political perspective is that they are a space where there is no agreed authority, mm -hmm. where there's not a set of rules that people say, yep, this is, I'm here to enforce them, these are the rules. And so it, it actually makes me think, yeah, I'm a big fan of the Simpsons, and one of my favorite Simpsons is when they go out to international waters, and there they can gamble and uh, enjoy a monkey knife fight. Monkey and knife fight. yes, right. Smithers, this monkey will need most of your skin. <laughs> um, but, you know, at the same time, this throws into stark relief the fact that a lot of problems that we associate with the commons are not actually problems of the commons. Mm -hmm. They're problems of reluctance to take on the responsibility for things that we consider universal. So if I look at a universal declaration of human rights, that is something that I happily support as long as we're all in favor of sovereignty because it's your problem to create those in your state. But now, holy crap, it's bleeding over into mine. And that's going to cost me money. What are the ethical obligations? How do universal rights and universal obligations interact with these obligations I still do have that are legitimate to my citizens to safeguard their economy, their quality of life. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think one thing it's worth saying, right, is that when it comes to something like immigration, it's not clear that we have a trade-off here um, because it's not obvious uh, that there are negative, that the, the negative effects of immigration on a country, or that the effects of immigration on a country are net negative. In fact, it seems like it, they're net positive mostly. So one thing I would say is that one just I think one thing like adopting a sort of realist sovereignty lens to these things does lead to a tendency to ignore the co-benefits of the right right so we so we think about regulating the commons in terms of like how costly or enforcing human rights how costly it is to us but of course there are costs associated with not doing those things and I think there's a tendency to sort of uh, there's a tendency to kind of ignore the possible co-benefits that's one thing I would say um, but the other thing I'd say is that it's true that there are certain duties that we'd say are conventional. Like my duty to raise my hand in a classroom depends upon the classroom having a rule by which raising your hand signifies certain things. But then there's also, we might say, what we might call duties of rescue, mm -hmm. in which there are people just have interests that are so urgent and we can do something about them and we're obligated to do it. The classic example of this is Peter Singer uh, talking about walking across a pond, walking to a pond, and you see a baby drowning in a pond. Philosophers always come up with very violent and sort of nasty examples uh, in their ethics. But you come across a baby, and the baby's drowning in a pond. And he says, so what's, you know, you can say, like, well, is the baby Canadian? No, you don't ask that question, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because 
the person because you can save the baby relatively easily. You can save the baby relatively easily, and the baby has a certain sort of uh, status that requires that you respond to it. So I would say, in it seems like when it comes to maritime immigration, where I would come across with the Greek, say for example, the Greek government, is that they're just fundamentally failing their moral duties of rescue. Um, you know, I, I think, and, and I tend to agree with you that there is a strong tendency, and it's been amplified in the last decade uh, in both Europe and America to highlight the costs and negative externalities of immigration. At the same time, it is not costless to do this. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to our baby drowning. Yeah. I'm wearing a really nice suit, <laughs> and I borrowed it, and I can't afford to pay for it. Am I obligated to jump into the pond if it's going to ruin the suit? Yeah, I, so I would say so. But we also what we have here is we have nested obligations, which is that the suit lending company probably also has an obligation to forgive your debt in the event that you do it. I think a nice example of this would be, the, you know, so think about, you know, in the sort of Mediterranean context, right? The EU has laws and rules about immigration that strongly place the negative, the, the costs of, of dealing with immigration on the bordering states, Spain, Italy, Greece, and that kind of thing. Whereas the relative, whereas the better or more well-off nations in the north, I live in the Netherlands, right? And the Netherlands is not a friendly country to immigrants. Um, I'm an expat, not an immigrant, so they like me. That's, that's really just about, you know, you think about expat as just immigrant you like versus immigrant you don't like. Um, uh, so that's really what it means. Um, uh, so the Netherlands says, oh yeah, yeah, you know, you know, the, the country of entrance, right? The border country, they're the one that take care, that take care of it, right? Seems very clear to me that Germany and the Netherlands have also failed their own meta duty of rescue by imposing an unfair distribution of burdens upon the bordering nations of Europe. But I don't think that actually stops you from having to save the baby, right? Suppose you're go walking by these ponds, and there are always babies in the pond. There are a bunch of babies in ponds, right? And there's all these people who are just take a different route. Yeah, just, yeah, just, just try to take walk a past the pond. Right. Yeah, take no, that's route. problem solved. Well, why are all these babies in ponds, right? You know, and then, um, and then there's like, and then there is a bunch of people just standing around the pond, not doing anything. And then you come up, and everyone's like, "Well, why? What are you doing?" And they're like, "Oh, I mean." This isn't our responsibility. And you're, like, and you're like, those people Those people are simply wrong, but that doesn't change your duty to save the baby. So, and, and I hate to leave the topic of babies and ponds, <laughs> but um, when we come down to things that states fight over, ordinarily it is the use of coercion or force mm -hmm. in order to protect their people, their property, their interests, their commerce. Mm-hmm. There does a lot of work in that. Mm -hmm. It's something that belongs to a sovereign state or in which a sovereign state has an interest. Is it conceivable to you that there are interests in the commons that rise to the level of justifying the use of force by a state against another state? So I'll give you an example of something that I've done in my work. And I just, it, it, whether we characterize this as a use of force is an interesting question, um, but it could very well be. Um, is that I wrote, a, I wrote a paper that was about a country that was suffering very severe climate impacts. And these climate impacts were going to come very soon. And there was no expectation that the global, uh, the, there was no expectation that the global um, uh, uh, order was going to act swiftly enough in order to prevent, say, sea level rise or something like that. So let's imagine this is the Maldives or the, or the Marshall Islands or something like that. And uh, they could them do it themselves or delegate uh, Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, uh, or China, I suppose, interesting question, um, to do radical geoengineering in order to prevent the impacts from occurring in a way that they very clearly knew, they very clearly knew was going to impose pretty severe negative impacts on other people around the world. I think in that particular context, it makes a, I think it makes a lot of sense to say this is an existential risk to our country, and we're justified in engaging it. But I also think that people can be justified in trying to stop them. So that's where I think we get into this sort of complicated, this is why I say ethical dilemma, is that with this kind of system, you have a case where both sides might be justified. They might be justified in using force, 
the other side might be justified in resisting because these moral values are operating at different levels. One person's trying to defend a universal value, one person's trying to defend a particular value. So you're, you're raising that specter takes my mind to this question of, we think of the commons as a place in which states contend. But of course, oftentimes the actors in the commons are companies, mm -hmm. and at times they can be individuals. Mm -hmm. And so one thing comes to mind is in the use of space, the Starlink constellation. Mm -hmm. A lot of concern has been raised of the number of objects in low Earth orbit. There's a finite number of low Earth orbits available, but there's also an interesting conflict between the tangible resource of low Earth orbits and the intangible resource of scientific exploration of the cosmos because mm -hmm. it's gotten to the point where the constellations are interfering with astronomical observations. Mm -hmm. So that's one question is how do you weigh those sorts of things? And the other one I'll throw in is what do you do when an individual acting on their own cognizance decides that they're going to interfere in the commons? Mm -hmm. When Elon Musk decides geoengineering is promising and I'm gonna go do it. Yeah. Not a state, not a company, me. I have the money, I'm gonna make this happen. Is that ethically permissible? I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind, I, 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 so what, was it Elon Musk unilaterally? No, I, right now I don't think it's permissible. Uh, are there contexts in which I could imagine uh, it being permissible, perhaps, uh, but we could talk about, but, I, the difference between a Bond villain and a philanthropist is sometimes just a matter of the, the moral right, justification yeah. that they can offer for their actions. Yeah, I think that's right. But of course, the difference between a hero and a villain, a lot of times, is like, you know, if, if no one if no one kills the dog in the beginning of John Wick, John Wick is the villain in that piece, right? You know, no, no John Wick fans. All right, okay, fine. Um, so, um, one. So here's a here's something. Here's a tool that I think is useful to answer the first question. And I think it also in the generational question you're talking about. Um, has anyone here heard of the veil of ignorance? Okay, so the veil of ignorance uh, was a sort of decision strategy that John Rawls came up with. And the basic question he asked is, what would be the rules that you would adopt if you didn't know who you were gonna be in the system, right? So if you didn't know whether you were gonna be in the global south or the global north, or in this particular case, one thing that's useful, if you didn't know which generation you were gonna be in, right? So let's say, I, all I know is that I'm in, I'm in the present, but I don't know whether I'm gonna be generation one, generation three, generation four. And so when it comes to thinking about like comparing scientific exploration to the needs of the direct present, the question is, is where the rules you would adopt would be ones that you would reject, given that you didn't know where you were gonna be in, in, the, uh, in the ordering. Because that means, what that's, a, what that's indicating is that are you taking advantage of your superior position in terms of power to impose a set of rules that aren't acceptable to everybody else in the system? It's a test for that kind of thought. And I think that'd be a useful one to think about when you think about the ethics of the commons. It's like, if you didn't know who you were gonna be, what rules would you adopt? I like that. And you know, I think one of the critiques that are, is often levied against the imposition of regimes of constraint in the commons is that they reflect the interests of the economically developed powers mm -hmm. and the powers that have had access. And you know, this, this is actually a, a critique of international law more generally. I yes. think there's a, an entire school that says this is epiphenomenal, it's just the most efficient way of getting states to do what powerful states want them to do. It's, it's a whole lot easier than having to use force to in, install it. So how do you address that critique when it comes to setting standards for preservation that cross cultures, that cross generations, that cross nationalities? I is that an addressable critique or do you just accept that someone's going to be able to raise a critique that it's unfair? Well, so I think there are probably two, two things here, right? So one is that there are crit criticisms that, we, that some people have referred to as sort of what are called the hermeneutics of suspicion. And so these are associated with Nietzsche, Foucault, and Marx, which are, um, which are basically things like, it's all, for Foucault, it's all about power. Uh, for Marx, it's all about cap, it's all about you know, uh, the ruling class, ruling, uh, the, the ruling economic classes. And there's a certain sense in which like, clearly it's true, right, that certain rules have been designed to favor the interests of the powerful. On the other hand, these, uh, these criticisms can take on the air of unfalsifiability, 
right? Because let's say I give you a liberal order in which it certainly looks like we're raising people out of poverty and we're treating, and treating people with respect or whatever, you know? Be like, no, 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 don't you see? That's an, even, that's an even more sophisticated use of capital to get what it wants. Well, I think, so I think the thing is, is that you're always gonna face those sorts of criticisms and sometimes uh, they're offered in good faith and you need, to be, you need to take them quite seriously and sometimes they're offered in sort of more or less bad faith. And I think uh, the answer, how you respond to them, depends on, try to make sure that you offer, you try to make sure that what you're doing benefits everybody. And then if everyone's benefiting, I think you'll find the criticisms are gonna be muted. So one version of law holds that law is rules backed by force. And there is a tradition, again, the sort of our law versus soft law tradition, all this sort of thing that says that. So is it conceivable to you that there can be an effective regime of rules and constraint that govern behaviors in ways that promote stewardship and responsibility without someone arrogating to themselves the authority to use force to make those things operative? Um, hmm. I mean, we're, gonna, we're getting pretty deep into the political theory weeds here. Uh, I guess what I would say is, um, is that to answer that question, we have to dig into a deeper question, which is what a philosopher is always going to say, I think, right? Uh, which is that what constitutes, what constitutes genuinely egalitarian relations in which we treat people as free and equal? So. If it is just equal consideration of people's interests, then I think Ostrom's view, which is that under certain circumstances, you can just have a consequentialist system that manages people's, uh, that manages people's behavior in order to serve interests. But there's another view, which is that partly, I need, being subject to the authority of another is ultimately a disrespectful kind of relationship. So what we need are a, politi a political system in which no one is subject to the arbitrary whims of another person. Uh, and for that, I think there's a good argument that goes through Rousseau and Kant that you need a, you need a democratically constrained uh, political collectivity um, that will guarantee and assure people's status as free and equal. But I do think it matters whether you're sort of a utilitarian consequentialist or whether you're, you, have this thick, you have this thicker notion of what political equality demands. And that's, that's worked really well in the domestic setting, so I see no potential problems applying sure, No, no, no. Well, that's why, you know, that's why all, all, the, all the Jacobins that came after Kant were people in favor of the world state, so, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. So I, I find this really interesting, but we should open it up for questions from, from the audience. What, what can we uh, address for you guys? Because if you don't ask anything, we'll keep making Simpsons references. Question of uh, climate justice, and you know we've got the green fund now, but I don't know whether your concept of compensation goes beyond that. That that, but the retroactive assigning of guilt is the kind of question that is interesting to me. We know that the tobacco industry, you know, suppressed scientific data that would have told us of the harm of smoking, or mm -hmm. now the attack is on the uh, oil industry, you know, on, on climate-related things. But if the political authority at the time did not know that it was harmful, and then 20 years later we look back and say, look at all the harm you did, yeah. um, how, from an ethical perspective, how do you parse that through? I mean, I think generally speaking, if it was, if it was, since if it was the case, um, if it was the case that they sincerely didn't know, right, and sincerely, and this, this could happen with like, so maybe we have a drug that we think cures cancer, and it turns out that there is some negative side effect that is only available way after any kind of randomized controlled trial could indicate it, right? So it just turns out, it just turns out it creates, it creates certain, it creates negative effects. You would say, look, it was, just, it was just epistemically unavailable to you that these negative consequences were gonna come. In that particular case, I'd say, you did the best you could with the available information, and you are sort of immune from moral liability. It might still be the case, though, that um, in that particular case, it still might be that, let's say now these people have these defects, these genetic defects created by the treatment, and it's expensive 
their care is expensive. We might say that the companies that benefited from the provision of the drug are like the first priority in terms of like paying for the care, even if it wasn't their fault. Um, but that's a sort of, uh, but that's a, because, because they might say that causal, not moral responsibility, but causal responsibility puts you at the top of the list. But that's a controversial view. Um, uh, but on the other hand, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, on the other hand, I think there's an additional thing, right, which is that suppose you're benefiting from this and you don't really look very hard into whether you're causing harm. That can be a more, that is, and, and I'd say that's closer to the Sacklers. Um, or you have high, you were engaged in highly motivated reasoning that you weren't engaged in harm. That can be a morally culpable attitude, and that certainly would, I think, constitute moral responsibility. Now, what was the West like? I would say until the 1980s, probably you're pretty close to sort of a sincere, even though there were people who were saying that, they, that our actions are gonna have these sorts of harms. I think there was also a genuine question as to whether, as to whether there was alternatives. Um, but certainly by you know, the Reagan administration going on, right, it was pretty obvious that climate, that, uh, or we had pretty good indication, and people just didn't care. Um, yeah, it, I, I think I would piggyback on that and say that the most common case I can think of is not a case where you genuinely believe what you're doing is okay. You may believe that it is neutral, that the ill effects are mitigated by the scope. So atmospheric nuclear testing comes to mind, mm -hmm. is that for decades we pursued atmospheric nuclear testing. There was a national security argument in favor of it. And the counter argument was basically, it's the atmosphere. It's huge. It's got all this, this space, it, and we can't harm it. And a similar approach has been taken in many issues related to the oceans, this idea that dilution is the solution. There's so much ocean, we're just putting in a little bit. But in those cases, it isn't that we didn't know we were doing harm. It's that we rationalized that the harm was mitigated by the scope of where it was going. And I think... That's a harder position to sustain that we had some sort of moral right because, of course, we knew that testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere had bad effects. That's why we didn't put people really close to nuclear weapons. Well, after a while. Um, you know, it – and the self-interest involved in the argument as to what mitigated it and made it acceptable I think makes it really, really tough to buy – that it was a genuine, sincere belief that what was going on was okay. I'd also say there's an addition to piggyback on that piggybacking. I think one other thing that can be morally culpable that's really important is if other people are trying to find out whether it's harmful and you make it harder for them to do it, right? So I think this is clearly true of the tobacco industry. Um, I mean, I think they, they knew pretty well, but like, let's say, but, but I, I think, but, I think this is the oil industry, right? Is that, I, you know, the oil industry, I think probably if you had talked to oil executives in the 60s and 70s, they would have said, global warming, what's that, right? They would have been genuinely ignorant of, what, of the possible consequences. But insofar as those companies acted to figure out what the, co what the costs were, they made it harder for other people to figure it out. And I think that, that kind of sort of motivated, so that kind of motivated ignorance and also the, the attempt to kind of like ensure other people are ignorant those are all morally culpable attitudes to have towards something, and I think it can it can generate culpable, it can generate moral culpability. Good question there. Hey, um, I, I guess I just want to follow up on that one. Um, what you were just just describing, Patrick, about the, and it reminds me of the things you said kind of at the, at the beginning in terms of the three possible branches of ethical obligations, right? The the restraint and forbearance option or the moral free-for-all or this third middle way of maybe I have a responsibility to participate in the creation of these structures. And the examples that you just gave of, of the tobacco industry and of, of our awareness of climate impacts, um, I, I almost wonder, is that third category even necessary? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, aren't whatever agent we're talking about, whether we're talking about the you know, the great superpower, or whether we're talking about the global south, or whether we're talking about you and me as individuals, don't we return back to one of those first two options where even if I feel I have an obligation to create these structures that we're talking about with, with you know, governance of the global commons, aren't I just going to either create them 
in a way that I feel there's some sort of obligation I have to a weaker agent, or I'm going to create them purely for the defense of my own interests. And then I kind of go back to Doyle's opening comments about in the self-help world of all this, like, does it really matter? So I guess I wonder, can you kind of expound on why is that third branch a necessary option? Good, good, good. So, uh, so I think here's the difference, right, is that, um, and, this, and this would really matter, it would matter your judgment about the possible effectiveness of your intervention to build, to build the institutions matters here, right? So and it, that's an empirical judgment, like how much can we improve the governance? But there's a difference here, right? In, in, in let's call it the pure restraint forbearance case, right? There's still an extent to which other people are exploiting the commons. Um, now, uh, the other people are, are, are exploiting the commons, and you're just sort of forbear, you're just restraining yourself, and you're forbearing taking any benefits yourself. Now, what happens though is that if you build the institutions, you're reciprocally binding people. So and you're reciprocally binding people, and the commons are gonna be governed in a way that will allow everyone to mutually benefit from the commons. Uh, and so it's true that in some sense, you're going to have to forbear uh, trying to maximize the governance structures to serve your own benefits, to serve your benefits. But that's not a sense in which, but, but, what it, but what you're gaining out of that is you're gaining benefits of legitimacy of the system and things like that that redound to your benefit. Whereas in the pure forbearance case, you are simply sacrificing your interests for no gain because the commons are also going to be consumed. This is a key feature of Hardin's argument, right? The key feature of the argument against the pure forbearance case is that it will make no difference to the consumption of the commons. Whereas the forbearance case in, let's call it the hybrid forbearance case, where you're creating institutions that are more equitable than your power would strictly, are more equitable than, uh, where you try to create more equitable institutions than you could get through sheer power. You gain legitimacy and you gain benefits from that in a way that's not true in the pure forbearance case. So Rawls talks about the difference between rational and reasonable. Rational people, they're just trying to maximize their own interests. Reasonable people have this additional interest, which is living in fair conditions with other people. Rousseau, Rousseau also talks about this, the additional interest of compassion. And so in the pure forbearance case, you don't get either, you don't get the fairness and you don't get the self-interest. In the hybrid third category, you can, you can get both of those interests met. Does that, make, I don't know, does that help at all? I'm going to try to provide maybe a, a, a flawed but concrete instantiation of that is everyone I know believes they're a good driver, an above average driver. And yet we forbear from driving in the spirited way that we might, not solely because we're afraid of the consequences of getting a ticket or otherwise being punished for it, but also because there's a recognition that when we all drive according to a set of norms, and they aren't the ones that are posted, by the way. You know, we all drive at least 10 miles an hour faster than the speed limit in many locations. But it's unacceptable to drive 25 miles an hour faster than the speed limit. When we forbear from indulging our spirited driving as much as we might, we do so not only for the benefits that accrue to us, but because it's part of our responsibility to others yeah. as we do that. And a nice example of how this works psychologically is the um, ultimatum game. Anyone heard of the ultimatum game? So this is where you have $10, and then I make an ultimatum to my, uh, the other player, and that's I offer them a split of the $10, right? So, and if they accept the split, then we get whatever I propose. So if I was purely rational, I would offer a $9, $1 split, because why would the person turn down that split? Because the only thing that matters, the only thing that happens if they turn down that split is they don't get the $1 but one dollar is better than zero dollars, but then I get nine dollars, right? So that's the, that's, you might say, that's the rational economic argument for how to do that split. Turn, a couple things are interesting. Turns out no one offers nine dollars, one dollar, and the few times they get offered, which is usually if they're an economic graduate student, uh, the few times they get offered, it gets turned down. And the psychologists have argued that this is because you have a certain kind of identity interest and in not coming across as an unfair jerk, and also you have an identity interest in sort of maintaining your status as not a mark or something like that, right? So that means, now, 
is it perfect? Does everyone offer 5-5? Five, five? No. People are aware that they have more power, so they offer 6-4 or 7-3, but they don't offer, for the most part, 8-2 or 9-1, because, there are, again, there are these warring interests, the interest in appearing fair and wanting to be treated fairly, but also the self-interest in sort of maximizing your wealth. Um, and so um, what's interesting, sorry, uh, what's interesting is that there's a version of this game called the dictation game. And the dictation game removes the requirement of, of the person accepting the deal. So they just say, so they just say, you get the split and the other person just gets the money and you get the split. It turns out even in the dictation game, people don't offer 9-1. It's more like, it's more like, now, what's funny is that they offer a more inequitable split. It's more like 7-3 instead of 6-4, because so they are aware that they have more power, but they still don't offer nine one, the, uh, a 9-1 split. And that's it, there's, and that's even when there's no shadow of the future. You're never, doing, you're never gonna see this person again. So people have this sort of intrinsic sort of concern in being treated fairly and treating people fairly, but it is, it definitely does not dominate and win all the time, right? So that's I think that's actually a great note to, to wrap up our discussion on because I, I think there's a strong tendency to view things in the commons through a realist lens and to think that anything that we do that diminishes the maximum take we could get is a sign of weakness or minimization of what we have. And, uh, you know, I, I think it, it helps to show that, no, there's, there's a value on being a part of a community. Kathleen, you had a uh, question for us. Please. I'm not quite sure if this question makes sense, but uh, you kind of already touched on it, Patrick, but the, is the indirect causal link between the use of resources in the developing world and their exploitation by the developed world? Um, and so kind of the ethical question of who should pay for the protection of that biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Right, there's also, there's also this thing called, uh, the, called the Kuznets Curve. And so the Kuznets Curve is uh, the level of environmental concern that people indicate. And it's, it's U-shaped. And so, and the, the X axis is wealth. Very poor countries care a lot about environmental protection because they rely upon the environment Rich countries rely upon the environment because they're already rich and they would like, the, and they, they want clean air and water. It's the middle part of the U where, where, the, where countries are growing, middle income, where you get the, where you get the most extensive environmental exploitation. Um, and that's because development matters more to them than, um, and if, I mean, if you've ever been to very poor the countries that are like that, it make, I, I think it makes sense that they care more about development than they care about environmental protection. Um, but that's in part because, but we can play a role in driving economically, uh, sorry, environmentally secure economic development. Uh, and the question is, and I, here's, I think the big question ethically is, are we doing that out of universal requirements of global distributive justice? Are we doing it out of a duty of rescue? Or are we doing it out of like a, a, a reparations or corrective justice dynamic? Because that changes that can change which agents have primary responsibility for the redistribution. Uh, because there might be some countries that have enjoyed, enjoyed a lot of the exploitation of the commons that ultimately don't, that ultimately don't have the resources or, have, or, or their re resources are differently structured. So again, it matters what you think the ethical basis of, um, of those duties of redistribution are. Um, because different agents, because if it's just universal distribution, maybe you think the United States has to do it, but not Exxon. But if it's exploitation, maybe you think Exxon specifically owes duties of, of reparations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but, um. and, and I think that's made the more challenging because although it's useful to separate those for purposes of analysis, they rarely operate as a sole causal motivation. <laughs> that usually there yes. is some element of all the above in there, and that allows the actors who acknowledge some responsibility for reparation to always argue that someone else has a greater responsibility for reparation. So the answer to who should pay for it is, well, I'm, I can chip in, but really it should be someone else. Um, and that's also, it also really matters, if, just from an ethical analysis perspective, whether you're doing it to serve people's interests or whether you're doing it to correct an injustice. Because if you're doing it to correct an injustice, 
then there might be a sense in which like you're just done. You've given back everything you stole, and now you don't owe anything more. But if you're doing it because you think there's some, like everybody has a right to a decent living or a decent life, then that might be a more demanding. Conversely, if they're developing on their own because neoliberal capitalism is working, then the universal requirement of everyone having a decent life might be less demanding than the corrective. Right. And again, so again, from an ethical perspective, it, the foundations, the ethical foundations of your duty are going to play a whole lot of role in terms of who has to do it and how much. Um, but as I said, rarely in the political sphere is that, the, is that the dominant reason why people are doing things. But never, but not, it's not totally, not totally uh, irrelevant either. Patrick, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, and thank you guys for the questions. I think at this point, if we take a 10-minute uh, break, we'll be back right in time for our final speaker. Thank you.